Hello, I'm A.J. Crystal. I am a member of the Naval War College Foundation. I'm a graduate of the Senior Reserve Officers course here, and I spent 10 summers here at the Naval Justice School uh, as an acting professor. I have a warm spot in my heart for Newport, and I'm honored and pleased to be here. As you were just told, I spent 38 years in the Navy as an aviator and an international lawyer. 60 years ago, this is what I was doing. Uh, okay. That's me. I hope so. <laughs> I'm here to talk to you about an event that occurred almost five decades ago. Why would an incident that is almost ancient history be of interest today? I had the same question about 28, 29 years ago when I got involved in this research project. On June 8, 1967, the fourth day of the Six Day War, the USS Liberty, a Navy overt electronic intelligence gatherer, failed to receive five military communications orders telling her to stay 100 miles away from the combat zone and sailed into the middle of a hot war. Only two, day <coughs> two days before, the United States has, had announced to the United Nations Security Council that the United States had no ships or planes within a hundred miles of the war zone. As a result of a series of blunders by both the US and Israel, the Liberty was mistakenly identified as hostile and attacked, resulting in the loss of 34 lives and 171 wounded. The incident has been investigated multiple times by both the United States and Israel, and every official investigation has concluded the incident was a tragic case of mistaken identity. Then why is there to this day any interest in the incident? When I had the honor of being appointed a federal judge, I thought my very busy lifestyle would calm down and I would have time to study, read, and write. I enrolled as an audit student at the Graduate School of International Studies at the University of Miami. I began researching and I published on terrorism. The faculty suggested that as a naval aviator for 18 years, a Navy lawyer who had been sent by the Department of Defense to teach law of naval warfare to senior foreign military officers at the International Institute of Humanitarian Law at San Remo, Italy, a civilian lawyer and a federal judge, that I was qualified to research and write on this subject. My initial response was, who would be interested? That was 20 years ago. A year earlier, I was on reserve active duty in the Pentagon, working for the Chief of Naval Operations, when an Iraqi fighter jet fired two Exocet missiles into the USS Stark in the Arabian or Persian Gulf, killing 37 US servicemen. A year later, that incident was forgotten. However, I soon learned that the Liberty incident was not forgotten and was brought up almost daily to, by conspiracy purveyors on talk shows, letters to the editor, and elsewhere. Since the 1967 Six-Day War, the United States-Israel relationship has continued to develop and become stronger and stronger to the mutual benefit of both nations. There are very few points on which to attack that relationship. The Liberty Incident is a primary focus point for the anti-Israel interests. There are apparently more different conspiracy stories about the Liberty Incident than about the JFK assassination. If we have time, I'll discuss a number of them later. For now, let us start at the beginning. The story began in 1956 when President Nasser of Egypt nationalized the Suez Canal. England, France, and Israel went to war in Operation Musketeer and took control of the canal. Three significant things occurred. 
Oops. First, the Israel Navy captured an Egyptian hunt-class destroyer, the Ibrahim Alawal. When signaled AA, International Code for Identify Yourself, the Egyptian signaled back AA. The Egyptian destroyer was swiftly disabled and captured by the Israel Navy. Second, the Israel Air Force concluded that having their high command headquarters in Ramla was not effective. They moved it to the IDF high command headquarters in Tel Aviv at the Kiria. Unfortunately, the Navy kept its high command headquarters in Haifa, atop Mount Carmel at Stella Maris, where the communication with the high command in Tel Aviv was by uh, closed television. Finally, and most important, President Eisenhower and Secretary of State John Foster Dulles forced Israel to withdraw from the Suez Canal and the Sinai. In exchange, they promised that the Sinai would be demilitarized, occupied by UN peacekeeping forces, and most important, the Straits of Tehran would remain open to Israel ships. Eisenhower specifically promised that the closing of the Straits would be a casus belli. So now we fast forward to 1967. Tensions were mounting. There were 14 Syria, uh, uh, terrorist attacks into Israel from Syria. Syrians were shelling farmers in Israel from the Golan. Syria and Egypt were making bellicose statements. Here's an Arab cartoon showing Nasser kicking Israel into the sea and his quote on May 30th, 1967. Our basic objective will be the destruction of Israel. The Arab people want to fight. Meanwhile, back in the United States, the USS Liberty was ready to sail. And in fact, on May 2nd, 1967, she sailed from her home port of Norfolk, Virginia, scheduled for a routine four-month deployment on the coast of Africa, bless you, uh, and where she would listen to the electromagnetic spectrum. Incidentally, I hear that they're trying to talk about uh, eight-month deployments now instead of six, but uh, hopefully that may not happen. May 14, 1967. Egyptian Field Marshal Amir ordered Egyptian troops into the Sinai and put the Egyptian army on alert. Next, Egypt ordered the UN peacekeeping force commanded by Indian General Reiki out of the Sinai. The UN complied. A week later, on May 21, 1967, President Nasser announced that he was closing the Straits of Tehran. Now, we had excellent communication with Israel and we knew what was going on in Israel and on Israel's side of this event. But uh, in Egypt, the U.S. ambassador, Lush Isbel, had left his post and returned to Washington. I interviewed him later in Washington, and he had not yet been replaced by Ambassador Nolte, who had not presented his credentials to President Nasser. And Nasser wouldn't speak to a deputy chief of mission, so the U.S. had no knowledge or no specific knowledge of what was going on on the Sinai, whether what Amir announced was true, and uh, they were concerned. I had the honor of interviewing Secretary of State Dean Rusk at Athens, Georgia, and he confirmed to me the excellent wide open communication between the U.S. and Israel and the lack of communication between the U.S. and Egypt. On May 23, the National Security Agency ordered Liberty, which at that time was in port in Abidjan, Ivory Coast, to proceed at best speed to a point off Egypt, near Port Said. Liberty sailed the next day on the 3,000 mile journey where she went to Rota, Spain and picked up some Arabic linguists and completed some, re some repairs. On June 2, the Liberty sailed from Rota, Spain into the Mediterranean for the coast of Sinai. On the morning of June 5, while Liberty was in the middle of the Mediterranean, the Israel Air Force struck all Egyptian air bases, destroying most of the Egyptian Air Force. The Liberty's mission 
had now been overcome by events. But Liberty's captain had not been briefed on why he was going to the coast of Sinai. The folks at the National Security Agency did not wake up to the problem until June 7 at 6.30 p.m. Washington time, which is about 30 minutes after midnight on June 8th, Sinai time. They sent a total of five naval messages to the Liberty telling her stand off. But as a result of mistakes, faulty protocols, and other problems with the U.S. military worldwide communication system, none of those messages were received by Liberty prior to the attack. What was happening in the Sinai? Israel armor had swept across the Sinai to the Suez Canal, but pockets of resistance remained, and Israel and Egypt Egyptian forces were engaged at El Arish. On June 7, the day before, an Egyptian destroyer shelled the Israel forces from a point off El Arish. On the fateful day, June 8th, at, at 5.58 in the morning, the Israeli morning reconnaissance flight spotted the Liberty. She was 70 miles west of Gaza, steaming southeast at 120 degrees, 10 knots. She was specifically identified by her hull numbers as the USS Liberty, and the information was sent to Israel Naval Intelligence at Stella Maris, where Admiral Arell, the Chief of the Navy, ordered a wedge, denoting Liberty marked neutral be placed on the War Situation Board in the War Room. The Liberty arrived at Port Point Alpha, its initial starting point off the Sinai, at 8.49 a.m. and turned to a westerly heading with its bow pointed towards Egypt and slowed to about five knots. The Liberty's logbook confirms that her crew observed the explosions occurring on shore at Al Arish. Now back in Haifa at Naval Command Headquarters at 11 o'clock, the shifts changed. And in the war room, Rami Luntz took over as command duty officer. Admiral Arell, the chief of the Navy, who knew about the wedge representing Liberty, had gone down to the port. And his number two, Issy Rahav, assumed overall command at about 11 a.m. Luntz looked at the wedge representing Liberty and concluded, ships do not remain still. Five hours later, the ship was no longer at the point of sighting so he directed the wedge be removed from the board. I learned in my research that today the, Egyptian, uh, the uh, Israeli naval commander sits at a computer and nothing that was put into that computer may be removed. I believe this is a direct result of this mistake that was made in 67. The original identification information remained down the hall in naval intelligence and, and with Admiral Orell, who was not in the war room, but down at the port. The stage was now set for disaster. The Israel army reported explosions to headquarters and said they were being shelled from the sea as on the day before. This was a mistake. The explosions were being generated on shore, but the army passed the information to Navy headquarters in Haifa and the Navy ordered motor torpedo boat division 914 from the port of Ashdod to investigate. The torpedo boats raced towards El Arish at their top speed. They picked up a radar target on the extreme edge of their World War II U.S. Army surplus Kelvin Hughes radar, which they had installed in their motor torpedo boats. When I began my research, I found the actual, one of the actual sets and the junk heap behind the Israel Naval Museum and took that picture. On the up, uh, the 20-year-old combat information officer miscalculated Liberty's speed at 28 or 30 knots. Of course, he was under the impression that the Liberty was a destroyer, which is a normal speed that a destroyer might make. The MTB division commander concluded they could not catch the target and called for air assistance. Now, anyone who knows of the rivalry between the Israel Navy and the Israel Air Force would be certain that if the Navy thought it could catch the target, 
they would have never have asked for assistance from the Air Force. The Navy in Haifa called its Air Force liaison officer, Lieutenant Commander Pincus Pinkazi, in Air Force headquarters in Tel Aviv and told him to request air support. Air Force headquarters in the Karia was a large room with a World War II type plotting table and a two-story structure overlooking the table. On the upper level sat Air Force Commander General Mahdi Had. To his right was Rafi Harlev, his deputy. Further right was the Chief Air Controller Shmuel Kislev and his deputy. To Had's left, behind a sliding glass window, sat Shaiki Bereket, the Air Force Chief of Intelligence. Under them, on the floor below, sat the Air Defense Officers and the Naval Liaison to the Air Force, Lieutenant Commander Pinkazi. Pinkazi picked up the phone and called Mahdi Had and was told the Air Force was too busy to provide air for the Navy. Pinkazi reported back to, to Haifa and was told by Naval Headquarters to be more aggressive. He got up and went upstairs to ask General Hod face to face for air support. <coughs> now for a moment we must digress to the night before, June 7, 1967. Israel radar reported three images of ships proceeding along the coast of Israel towards Tel Aviv. The Navy dispatched its three destroyers to engage them. The weather was broken clouds. The Air Force sent a flight of Mirage 3C aircraft to the scene. The pilots reported seeing three wakes on the surface and asked permission to attack. Admiral Orell, the commander of the Navy, said, hold. And General Hod, the Air Force commander, got testy and said, my planes are getting low on fuel. If we cannot attack, I'll have to send them back to their base. Admiral Orell said, give me illumination. One plane dove below the clouds and dropped a flare. And there were the three Israel destroyers. The radar targets had been false images. There were no enemy ships. So the next morning, when Pinkazi asked Hod for air support face to face, Hod said, what is this? Another Navy wild goose chase? Do you have a target? Pinkazi was on the spot. He replied, yes. So Hod told his chief air controller, Shmuel Kislev, to give the Navy air support. Here is where the Liberty had its first bit of luck on that sad day. The deputy air controller said, we have menorah flight, four Mirage 3C aircraft armed with iron bombs and route to the Suez Canal to bomb SAM sites. Kislev said, no, that mission is too important. Let Menorah go. Look for a flight that is ready to come home. So they searched and found a flight of two Mirage 3Cs doing combat air patrol over the canal. Now why was this lucky for Liberty? In World War II, at Midway, U.S. Navy dive bombers, armed with iron bombs, attacked the Japanese fleet and sank three aircraft carriers in 10 minutes and mortally wounded a fourth, which sank the next day. The deputy identified cursor flight, two Mirage 3C aircraft flying combat air patrol over the canal, armed with air-to-air -air combat 30-millimeter cannons. He told Cursa, fly to El Arish with the order, if you can find a warship there, you may attack it, but be careful. We have some of our Navy ships in the area. Cursa flew to Al Arish, and notwithstanding authorization, if you can find a warship there, you may attack it. Cursa first established communication with the torpedo boats and further confirmed that the Liberty was some kind of military ship before attacking. Cursa and his wing attacked flying head-on at the Liberty. This picture is from the U.S. Navy Court of Inquiry record. It was taken aboard the Liberty during the attack. I can't tell you if it was taken by Captain McGonagall or the ship's photographer because they both indicated they took pictures and the uh, record doesn't indicate who was the photographer. But the Mirage 3C, there it is. 
And uh, what do you think? Uh, could they see a uh, flag on the ship at that distance? And uh, there in the water are the splashes from the 30 millimeter cannon shells. The, sh the attacking aircraft is already firing at the Liberty at that distance. Now, an American flag was hoisted on the Liberty. Some conspiracy purveyors argue that the aircraft should have seen Liberty's American flag, which they say was flying. But a five by eight foot flag would not have been visible beyond a distance of 1,323 feet, and the attacking aircraft would have broken off their attack at no closer than 2,500 feet. Look at this attacking aircraft and think, uh, do you think that they could see a flag? The visual acuity formula, which you can verify with any physicist or ophthalmologist, tells you that you can't see uh, the, a flag, a 5 by 8 flag, any, any further away than 1,323 feet. But let us assume that the attacking aircraft flew inside the 1,323 feet viewing distance. What would a pilot see of a flying flag on a head-on run. Well, here's the flag, and if you're flying head-on at it, what do you see? The leading edge of the flag. There is no question the flag was hoisted, but was it flying? Look at the gun camera film of the smoke from the fire aboard Liberty. Imprudently, they had left cans of gasoline on the deck to fuel their motor whale boat, and the 30 millimeter cannon shells had struck those cans and started the fire. And the smoke, as you can see, is rising. But how is it rising? It's rising straight up. So if the smoke was rising straight up, it confirms there is no relative wind across the deck and a flag would not have been flying, but would have been drooped at the mast, and therefore very difficult, if not impossible, to see. Cursor flight, two aircraft each made three strafing runs over a period of five minutes. When Cursor flight exhausted their 30 millimeter ammunition, Cursor left for base. Air control had located Royal flight, two Super Mystere aircraft interdicting armor over the Sinai. They were also armed with 30 millimeter cannon and napalm canisters. Royal Flight was sent in as Cursor left. Royal Flight attacked from stern to bow. And here's another picture taken from Liberty and you can see the Super Mystere coming over the stern of the ship. Now on their first run, each of the uh, aircraft dropped both of their napalm canisters. Uh, I don't believe that any of them hit the ship, but it is possible that one of them did hit the ship. However, in the court of inquiry uh, record, the ship's doctor testified that he did not treat anyone for napalm burns. So even if one of the canisters did hit the ship, apparently it was of little or no effect. Royal flight leader, after its initial pass, made a 270 degree turn to the left to attack the ship broadside. As he came across, he observed Roman letters on Liberty's bow. He was aware that Arab ships are marked with Arabic script and therefore Liberty was not Arab. He reported this to headquarters and at 212, Kislev ordered, quote, leave her. At this point, Nine Liberty True members had been killed or mortally wounded. The Air Force halted the attack and left the scene. Then came Liberty's second tiny little bit of luck. The air controller had just located and launched Nixon flight armed with iron bombs from Telnoff Air Base only minutes away. Nixon flight was diverted to the north and Liberty was not attacked with anti-ship weapons, which most likely would have sunk her, which even more catastrophic results. Shortly thereafter, the motor torpedo boats arrived. They stopped a mile away and began signaling 
AA, identify yourself. The torpedo boat division commander, Moishi Oren, had been the gunnery officer on the Israel destroyer Jaffa in 1956 when they signaled AA and the Egyptian destroyer replied AA. Whether or not Liberty actually responded AA is in dispute, but this became immaterial because at this point, Liberty opened fire on the torpedo boats. This is confirmed by Liberty's commanding officer in his testimony before the Navy Court of Inquiry. In fact, he was, went so far as to say that he was certain that there was no question that the people on the motor torpedo boats could see and know that they were under fire. Oren's response was to ask permission from Navy headquarters for a torpedo attack. Oren radioed Navy headquarters in Haifa with the request. Captain Issy Rahab, the second in command of the Navy, had just received a phone call from the Air Force in Tel Aviv, advising of the concern about the identification of the ship. Rahab said, hold up, we have doubt about the ship's identification. It is not recorded, but I can imagine what Oren said to Rahab. You SOB, you're sitting there warm and dry and safe in Haifa. That ship is shooting at me. I have no doubt about its identification. It's hostile. The argument was persuasive and overwhelming. Rahab gave the okay for the torpedo attack and tragically 25 more Americans died from a torpedo which struck the middle of the Liberty. Now following the attack, Israel rescue helicopters arrived at 312, 44 minutes after the attack was over. A helicopter saw and reported an American flag on the ship. Conspiracy purveyors love to tell that an Israeli pilot was recorded reporting an American flag on the ship. But they neglect to tell that the pilot was not an attacking pilot and that the sighting was 44 minutes after the attack was over. Four interesting things happened. When the Israeli High Command learned they had attacked an American ship, they immediately advised U.S. Naval Attaché Commander Ernest Castle and he sent a flash message at 414 to the White House, to the commander of the Sixth Fleet, and others advising of the event and conveying Israel's apology. Ca the Castle message had this curious effect of generating waves of relief. While the Israel High Command, well, when the Israel High Command received Royal Flight Leader's message, now pay attention, this ship is marked CTR. Five, the message terrorized the high command headquarters in the Kiria. Royal had misread the G for a C. Hearing that the ship's markings began with a C suggested the ship was Soviet. There were at least five Soviet intelligence gathering ships in the eastern Mediterranean and all of their markings began with C. If Israel had attacked the Soviet ship it would be an excuse for the Russians to enter the war on the side of the Arabs and take away all of Israel's gains. When it was determined that the ship wa was attacked by uh, Israel and not, not, uh, not Soviets, a wave of relief swept through the Kiria. Now, President Johnson was in his bedroom on the morning of June 8th when he got the first message by telephone from Walt Rostow that one of our ships had been torpedoed in the Mediterranean. With him was George Christian, his press secretary. And George Christian told me, the president looked at him and said, George, if this is an attack by the Russians, it looks like we have to go to war. But when the initial word of the castle message reached the White House, it was still, uh, th they were still wondering who had attacked. Johnson had ordered his national security team to meet in the Situation Room, and they sat there fearful the attackers were Soviet and wondering what would be or should be the U.S. response. Should it be a strike back at Russia? Is it the beginning of World War III? Are we on the edge of a nuclear exchange? 
and then Castle's message arrived and here's the team in the uh, situation room you can see Dean Rusk and George Bundy and Clark Clifford and the president is standing under a clock and if you look at it closely you'll see it's right around 11 o'clock and that was a, a, about the time that the message arrived advising the United States that the uh, attack had been by Israel and not by the Soviets and as a result a wave of relief swept through the White House Situation Room. The situation that the attacker was our friend Israel not the Soviet Union. World War III was off the table. But out in the Mediterranean with the Sixth Fleet, Admiral Martin was aboard his flagship, the Little Rock. And his staff had the same concern as Washington, except it was more immediate. The USS Saratoga, one of two carriers, Saratoga and America, that were steaming with the Sixth Fleet, was steaming alongside a Soviet destroyer. They had their guns pointed at each other. Should the United States open fire first? Were the Soviets about to open fire? When the castle message reached the bridge, the flag bridge of uh, the Little Rock, a wave of relief swept through the flag bridge. It was not time to start fighting with the Russians. Finally, at the US Embassy in Cairo, where the initial report of the attack had been received, there was deep concern that the Egyptians or the Soviets had attacked the Liberty, and that would bring the U.S. into the war on the side of Israel. <clears throat> now, the U.S. Embassy, this is the old one, was in the heart of Cairo. I'd been there, and in my opinion, it's since been rebuilt, but in my opinion, it was the least secure and most unprotected U.S. Embassy in the world. The embassy was under siege by street mobs and it was uncertain if the Egyptian army or police would continue to protect the embassy. When the castle message was received confirming that Israel and not Egypt or the Soviets had attacked Liberty, uh, Ambassador Richard Parker, uh, Ambassador Parker was a wonderful gentleman. He served as ambassador to three Arab states and uh, he was very helpful to me in my research. Sadly, he passed away in January. But at the time, he was a political counselor in the embassy and confirmed that a wave of relief swept through the U.S. Embassy in Cairo. Well, back in Israel, Israel provided Castle with a Super Freelon helicopter. And he flew out to the Liberty and was the first U.S. person to reach her. The aircraft of the Sixth Fleet were hours away and the ships almost a day away. Castle was initially mad as hell. He has assisted in the U.S. investigations, and as the investigations were completed, he became convinced that the attack was a tragic case of mistaken identity. Here's what Captain Castle told Thames Television in 1983. Let us presume the Israeli high command was so fearful that the United States would learn of what was an evidence Israeli plan to take the Golden Man, or any other plan on the part of the Israelis, when they say, my golly, that will irritate the United States, our great friend. We better not do that or let that happen. So let's sink their ship instead. Let us presume it was a premeditated plan for whatever reason to get rid of a United States ship that was a threat to Israel. Then, the nation that had just, in 22 minutes, destroyed an entire Egyptian Air Force, had captured all of the Egyptian armor in the Sinai, if they had decided they had to take the United States ship, I believe they would have done so. 25 years later to the day, almost to the minute, I piloted a plane from Stay Dove Airport, north of Tel Aviv, where Castle had taken off in 1967. I flew Castle and Israel Lieutenant Colonel Danny Grossman to the GPS spot where Castle had flown over the Liberty on June 8, 1967. We circled the spot 
and I dropped 34 flowers in memory of the lost. Castle recited a blessing on the lost and their families and the U.S. Navy hymn. Lieutenant, Gro Lieutenant Colonel Grossman intoned the Kaddish, the Jewish prayer for the dead, in memory of the American Jewish sailor who died in the attack on the Liberty. When I published the Liberty Incident in 2002, I had been fortunate enough to obtain transcripts of the Israel Air Force audio tapes, and they were included in the book. How they clearly show the attack was a case of mistaken identity. However, conspiracy purveyors claimed the tapes were fabricated by Israel after the attack. There were rumors that the United States National Security Agency had audio tapes that proved the attack was deliberate. The U.S. had an EC-121 flying in the Mediterranean that made some recordings. And in a letter dated March 3, 2000, Chief Petty Officer Marvin Nowicki, the NSA Hebrew linguist who was with NSA Hebrew linguist Petty Officer Michael Prostiniak, recorded the NSA tapes. And these are the tapes that no, uh, Nowicki told about to uh, James Bamford. And he said they showed the attack was a mistake. Bamford, nevertheless, wrote in a book that the tapes proved the attack was deliberate. Now, here's a picture of uh, what Nowicki and Prostiniak receiving awards for their work. Uh, they were two of the Navy's Hebrew linguists, uh, the Navy did or, or the NSA's uh, Hebrew linguists. They didn't have very many at the time. And uh, when the book came out, Nowicki responded with a letter to the Wall Street Journal. And in his letter, which was published May 16, 2001, uh, he concluded, my position is the opposite of Mr. Bamford's. It is that the attack, though terrible and tragic, especially to the crew members and their families, was a gross error. How can I prove it? I can't, unless the transcripts tapes are found and released to the public. Following the publish publication of the 2002 volume on the Liberty Incident, I sued the National Security Agency for release of their tapes. I prevailed. I commend them, they're not sore losers. They were very cooperative. And the release of the tapes made the New York Times and the Associated Press. Here you can see the New York Times headline, Recordings Back Israel Claim on Spy Ship. As a result of this release, uh, I had my 15 minutes of fame on CNN with Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> A 30-year-old mystery. What really happened in the Israeli attack on the USS Liberty? We'll sort through some newly released classified information. Welcome back. This past week, the U.S. government declassified secrets about a long-time naval controversy. A 1967 attack by Israeli forces on the USS Liberty. <laughs> Hebrew of Israeli pilots and ground control and English transcripts, now being made public by the U.S. National Security Agency, shed new light on one of the most controversial mysteries in U.S. Navy history. Why did the Israelis attack an American surveillance ship that was monitoring communications in the Six-Day War? On the tape, recorded by a nearby American surveillance aircraft, you hear the Israeli ground controller talking to rescue helicopter pilots sent in after the initial Israeli attack. For your info, it is apparently an Arab ship. Roger. It is an Egyptian supply ship. Roger. The NSA tapes are included as an appendix in the new book, The Liberty Incident Revealed, and they dovetail exactly with the Israeli Air Force tapes, so they validate each other and confirm that the Israeli tapes were not fabricated, but were, in essence, recordings of the same information that was recorded by the National Security Agency. If you'd like to listen to the tapes, you can listen to them in Hebrew on the National Security Agency website. 
They're posted there under www.nsa.gov. And you can read there also the NSA translations of the tapes that were made there by another NSA Hebrew linguist. Less than a year after the release of the NSA tapes, the United States State Department released Volume 19 of Foreign Relations of the United States, which contains many additional State Department, Defense Department, White House, CIA, and other documents all further confirming the attack was a mistake. Since then, some conspiracy purveyors have claimed that the State Department, the National Security Agency, and I are engaged in a conspiracy to fool the American people. I'm honored to be included with such uh, <laughs> distinguished organizations. I will admit that I was invited by the State Department to appear and speak on January 12, 2004, together with the historian for the State Department, the historian for the CIA, the historian for the National Security Agency, at a symposium in the uh, Loy Auditorium at the State Department. At that event, I presented a paper on the incident, co-written by me, together with Captain Ernest Castle, who you saw a few moments ago, and by the CIA chief of station in Tel Aviv in 1967. In the earlier book, that's how he's identified. However, since then, he's come out, and his name, John Hatton, is on the uh, article that Ernie Castle and I wrote together. I was also thereafter invited to speak at the National Security Agency Symposium on October 12, 2009. Perhaps it was best stated by Richard Hickman he was the National Security Agency Hebrew linguist who translated the NSA tapes at Fort Meade for the NSA. Hickman was in the Navy in 1967 and uh, was one of the few Hebrew linguists at NSA. Uh, he had sailed with uh, the uh, Lopez on a, uh, a cruise together with an NSA civilian named Al Blue, and uh, here's what he had to say. Al Blue, the NSA Arabic linguist, was a friend of mine, and Zeli Al died in the attack. We were both on the Valdez during February, April of 67, having picked up the ship in Masua, Ethiopia, and rode it up the canal into the Mediterranean and out to Barcelona. When we returned, they told us we had to go right back out and get on the Liberty. I told them I was due to be discharged from the Navy in June of 67, and it was unlikely the Navy would let me go with so little time left. So they agreed that I couldn't go, which resulted in no Hebrew linguist aboard the Liberty. But they said Al Blue had to go. So because of the fact that I'd lost a good friend in Al, and of course, Naval Security Group shipmates and other wounded civilians, I was ready to blame the Israelis along with everyone else who was angry. But based on what I heard, both from eyewitnesses and the tapes, my conclusion has always been that it was a case of mistaken identity. Now, of the several conspiracy stories that we talked about, I'll mention just two. In 1967, Yuri Primakov, who at that time was an editor for Pravda and uh, ultimately became the, uh, through the KGB, became the Prime Minister of the Soviet Union, he wrote some articles in Pravda and a book about the Six Day War, which he titled, The Dove Has Been Released. He claimed the liberty was there fighting with Israel against the Arabs and the attack was coordinated between the CIA and Israel to cover up the US participation. This story is most beloved by the Arabs as it, they found it easier to accept their defeat at the hands of superpower USA <coughs> rather than little Israel. Another writer, John Loftus, has a story that the Liberty was there fighting with the Arabs against Israel. 
Both stories are pure nonsense. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but no one is entitled to their own facts. In this case, the facts are clear that the tragedy was a result of mistaken identity caused by a series of blunders by both U.S. and Israel. While we'd like to go on for several hours, I believe now is the time to stop for questions. <laughs> Yes, sir. Was the seaworthy? Uh, was excuse me, Was the Liberty seaworthy after the attack? Uh, the Liberty after the attack. Uh, well, they, they they were sailing up parallel to the coast. They turned north out to sea, and they sailed a while with the fires burning, and uh, they they had a lot of mechanical problems, and ultimately the ship became dead in the water. The ship was. Uh, reached by the Davis and the Massey sent by the Sixth Fleet, but almost tw not quite 20, about 23 or, or 21 hours later. And at that time, the uh, Davis put on board a gentleman named Paul Tobin, who many of you may have known. He uh, ultimate, ultimately became the oceanographer of the Navy, and then he was the director of the Naval Historical Center in uh, Washington. And he and uh, their ship's uh, damage control officer worked on the problem. They got the boilers up. They got the ship underway. And they were originally ordered to go to Crete. And while en route, they got a message, no, go to Malta instead. So they sailed under their own power. The Navy uh, tugboat, Papagaya, was also sent to the scene to tow them. But it wasn't necessary. Liberty could proceed under its own power. And the Papagaya. Uh, trailed a quarter of a mile behind watching for anything that might wash out the hole in the side of the ship so that no secret documents were lost. Yes, sir. I recall that there was a ceremony later about passing out decorations. Who got them and what were they for? Well, there were several ceremonies. One ceremony uh, was, uh, well, I mean, there were many purple hearts, many bronze stars, many silver stars. One silver star went to uh, Commander Maurice Bennett. Maurice Bennett got a silver star and the Purple Heart for saving lives on the ship that day. When my first book came out, Bennett read it and sent a message to his friends on the Liberty. Uh, I've read the book and it seems to explain everything. He got return messages, you traitor. In any event, uh, there are uh, a number of, uh, I mean, there's quite a number of photos which you can see of the people getting their awards. I can't tell you the number, but a large number. And then there was a separate award given to the uh, captain of the Liberty, Bill McGonigal. And Bill was awarded the Medal of Honor. And it was awarded at the, Na the Washington Navy Yard. And some people said that this was a slight by the president. And uh, I did some research on that and I discovered that both the State Department and the Defense Department wanted to keep this low key because of these arguments that uh, Liberty was there fighting f against the Arabs and they set it up at the uh, Washington Navy Yard. I've been there for retirement services of many of my friends and there are many other Medal of Honors uh, given there. But uh, in any event, uh, there was a story that President Johnson gave 13 medals of honor at the White House the same day that uh, McGonagall got his medal of honor at the Navy Yard. Uh, check that out. And that's false. I have a letter from Bill McGonagall with whom I became friendly over the course of my research and in which I said to him, look, if he didn't want to, I mean, honor you, he could have just not signed the citation. And uh, Bill said, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so uh, I can't tell you uh, the total number, but uh, there were several, uh, numerous awards. <coughs> yes, sir. Given that uh, Liberty was not engaged in espionage, I would assume that the subtitle of your book, identifying it as a spy ship, uh, you're was, right. Was not of your doing. You're right. That's the publisher's idea. Uh, as I started out, <laughs> as I started out, I I said a navy overt intelligence gatherer. And now Liberty was sailing 
normally on the high seas and listening to what was broadcast. That's not spying, that's intelligence gathering, which is 95% of what the CIA does. But uh, nevertheless, uh, if you'll pardon my saying so, uh, a spy ship sounds more sexy than an overt intelligence <laughs> gathering, and that's why the publisher... I guess it does. <laughs> yes, sir. You don't need to see an American flag to recognize whether a ship is a combatant or not a combatant, particularly whether it's capable of bombarding a shoreline. I mean, you know, you know, I know, all of us aviators know, you know from over a mile away what kind of ship that is. How was that explained in all of this? Well, I mean, there were a number of, uh, first of all, remember there were numerous mistakes. And uh, this was in the middle of uh, a situation where shooting was going on. Uh, there had been the shooting the, the day before by a destroyer. And now uh, here's a ship 14 miles offshore, not a mile, but 14 miles offshore. It's Battleship Gray. And as you know, the definition of a warship under international law is that it's uh, painted the normal color of warships that is commanded by uh, um, an officer of the Navy that the crew is subject to the law of war and there's one other criteria so I mean uh, it was a, as I say it was it was a mistake uh, perhaps they it's easy to, for us to sit here like uh, Issy Rahab warm and dry with no one shooting at us and say uh, oh you should have recognized that uh, but but nevertheless it was battleship gray it was a uh, in essence it looked like a warship and uh, uh, the Israeli Navy, unlike our Navy, has had a very limited experience in naval aviation. Uh, in 1948, they sent out a uh, beach bonanza with two guys in it to fly over an Egyptian ship and throw a hand grenade. They opened the door and the plane spun in and it was lost. In 1956, uh, Danny Shapira, the chief test pilot of the Israel Air Force, was leading a flight of Mirage Three Seas down near the Red Sea. And they saw what looked like uh, a destroyer. Well, of course, remember the Egyptians had scurry class destroyers and Z-class destroyers. This was a Z-class destroyer. And they attacked it. And Danny told me that they, very, they felt terrible about it when they learned that it was a, a British ship, the Crane, and not... Uh, an Egyptian ship and I and my research got to London I went to Whitehall I got the British Navy's records and they pulled them out and here was the report and the good news was they didn't kill anybody one soldier suffered a broken tibia and so when I was able to go back to Israel and tell daddy that he, he could take that off his conscience he felt very good about it so uh, there the very, I, I can't think of any other incidents where Israel's involved in naval aviation. The Israel Navy has no air dedicated to it. The, uh, their air is uh, assigned by the Air Force, and in 67, they had a Nord 2501 twice a day. At dawn and at sunset, it went out and flew an arc and reported what it saw. But uh, they're not the great naval power that perhaps... The United States or England is. Uh, oh, okay, yes. Okay. Uh, the, the lettering on the bow of that ship looked like a C. Yes, sir. Maybe they need some new sign painters. <laughs> That's a thought. Yes, sir. I'm just thinking, did you say this was within a day or so or when they wiped out the Egyptian armored force? Well, that's, uh, that's what Castle said. Uh, because, I mean, the confusion and the so forth, I just wanted to know who anybody was. Well, I mean, the, there, w there was stuff going on. And, of course, there's another explanation that comes from uh, uh, some of the folks in Israel. The CIC officer who made the mistake on the speed, 22-year-old guy, he was so upset about this that he left the Navy and switched to the Air Force and became an F-16 pilot. But the story that he likes to tell is that on the first day of the Six-Day War, the Navy launched six SEAL missions into six Arab ports. Down in Alexandria, it was a total disaster. They lost some people. Up north in Syria, at Latakia, they sent people in, accomplished nothing, and 914 was supposed to take them out. 
they got them all on board, and while milling around, one boat bumped into the other. So they had a hole about this big in one of their boats. They went back to Ashdod, and within 10 hours, it was fully repaired. So uh, uh, Ifrak likes to say that uh, on the fourth day of the war, the paratroopers had captured Jerusalem and the West Bank. The armor had gotten to the Suez Canal and was dipping their feet in it. And the Navy, we had made a hole in one of our own boats. <laughs> we were anxious to get some action. Uh, let's, oh, let's see. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Commander Guy Barat from the Israeli Navy. I'm uh, here a student at the Naval War College uh, at the international program. I heard your lecture before in the Israeli uh, Naval Academy, and, and it's a pleasure to hear you again. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that until today, we're not, uh, we're not counting on our pilots to recognize chips at sea. We will leave it to the, to the Navy people, not to our aviators. Um, but my question is actually, of course, there are many uh, tactical and strategical lessons learned from, from this uh, incident. And, and, and I'm still thinking if, if uh, according to the US public opinion, uh, m many years ago it, it happened, and new evidence came out during the years. Uh, and, and there's many things in the US that it lay on the public opinion. How do you drain the public opinion today on, on this, this incident, regard to all the, all the um, uh, you know, stories that people tell and, and not seeing the facts as you, as you perform them? Well, to tell you the truth, what started out as a one-year project and is now in its 29th year is uh, a bit of a disappointment because when I started the project, I thought, okay, I'll research it, I'll gather the facts, I'll publish them, and that'll be the end of this. No, there are people who, uh, for example, American Educational Trust, uh, founded by two former State Department uh, Arabist-leaning uh, people, uh, publish a slick magazine out of Washington. There's a fellow named uh, uh, Paul Findlay, who was a congressman from uh, Chicago, who founded the Liberty Veterans uh, Association. And these people basically are anti-Israel and are not interested in facts or truth. They're interested in attacking Israel. And so uh, what I thought was going to be a simple matter of laying this to rest in a year, 29 years later, there are still um, People out there every day telling conspiracy stories and of course uh, when they're told and there's nothing in opposition to them, uh, many people believe them. So, yes sir. Uh, that wasn't the only attack on an American intelligence gathering ship. Some years later, uh, another lonely ship was attacked and captured by the North Koreans. That was uh, nine months later, the Pueblo, and as a matter of fact, there's a very excellent writer, Phil Goulding, who was Under Secretary of State for Public Affairs, who wrote a very excellent book called Confirm or Deny. One of the things that I have uh, taken from his book and have never forgotten is he says, whenever something happens at a distance, the first message that you get is either incorrect or incomplete. But uh, he told in his book how he argued with state and defense that the, uh, they should tell the truth what the ship was doing there. And the argument that overcame that and resulted in a phony press release was that, oh, these ships are they're going around the world and they're welcome everywhere and if we tell what they're really doing, they won't be welcome. So they made up the phony press release, but it, it didn't work. And as you pointed out, the uh, Pueblo was captured nine months later. Their captain was, uh, as I recall, was court-martialed. Uh, and uh, in case you're interested, the ship is still on the Registry of Naval Ships, although it's docked in North Korea, and if you can get to North Korea, you can visit it as a tourist attraction. <laughs> Do we still conduct the surveillance? No, about this time, these ships became obsolete because we got into satellites. Satellite can go at an altitude where there's no human life involved, listen as well or better than these ships could do, and so within the next few years they were all phased out and uh, shut down. Yes, sir? Administrative matter, the, the judge will be here as long as you can keep him here, it being two bills plus a little bit, let's consider the eight bills itself over and release those of you who have other tasks to go to. Thank you so much.